get a mess into the message, I just wanted to uh, make a quick announcement and let you know, um, keep you updated we're, uh, on our next project here at COTC. And uh, what we're tackling next, and we're always trying to improve what we do uh, uh, in our, our building and grounds. We always want to make a good and, uh, first impression. Our, our whole heart here is to reach people far from God, and we want, want them to know that we take it very seriously. So when he said foot on grounds here, we want everything to, to really look well and be inviting. Well, the next project we want to do is to remodel the two bathrooms here near the sanctuary, uh, the women's bathroom and the men's bathroom. And so the cost of that project project will be $25,000. And so uh, the good news is I've approached different uh, people in our congregation and leaders, and we already have $22,500 already raised, which is praise God. Amen. So uh, what I want to encourage you to do, if you would pray between now and next week and ask God to, uh, to put a, uh, a amount on your uh, heart, um, and just that would be over and above your tithe and offering. And then we're going to take that um, uh, offering next week. Now, here's the deal. If we go over $2,500, anything over and above that, we're going to just put in a, another account and let that build up for the bathrooms near the oasis because we know those need to be remodeled as well. Our heart, Lord willing, we'd like to have it done by Easter. So anyway, uh, just uh, present that to you guys and thank you ahead of time for your faithfulness. You're an awesome church and together uh, we will do this. Again, thank you. Well, we started a brand new series last week called Rooted. And over the next few weeks in this series, we're just answering different questions concerning the Bible and, and how do I use the Bible to, to make good decisions? How do I use the Bible to overcome temptations? And today we want to answer the question, why the Bible can be trusted. I want to start off by reading 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It says this, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for showing people what is wrong in our lives for correcting fault and for teaching how to live right. And I just want to kind of highlight that, that, that one word there says useful. And this book, book is never meant for us just to come together uh, on a weekend service and just kind of have this kumbaya moment where we read it and we kind of go back into our, our homes and our workplaces. It's actually supposed to get into every part of your life. It's supposed to get into your marriage, how you live your life at work, and, and really how you live your life, period. And the scripture goes on to say this, using the scripture, the person who serves God will be capable having all that is needed to do every good work. And, and as leadership team, we're trying to be very strategic in what we're doing on the weekend services. I don't know if you remember, we started the, the uh, year off with a 21 day of fasting and prayer. And the strategy behind that was to, to help you to develop uh, a habit of spending time with God on a daily uh, basis praying and, and spending time with God. In this series, uh, we're focusing on the, the importance of the Word of God in our life with the challenge of really getting to a place where we would really begin to read it, to love it, and to live the Word of God, the Word of God out in our life. And then the next series, following this series, is going to be called Mirror, and, and we're going to be looking at how we view ourselves in light of the Bible, because it's very important to understand how God views us, because so often that really holds us back from really being all that God wants us to, uh, to be. So that's gonna be a great series, you won't wanna miss it. Well today I wanna really kinda help you out and come alongside you because in, our, in today's culture, we just have these lies bombarding us saying, you know what, the, the Bible uh, is not true or it's only partially true. And I wanna come alongside you and help you understand that you can trust the Bible. And actually Psalms 119 says this, all of your commands can be trusted. And I wanna just give you something tonight, today called apologetics. And most of this information has come from a couple resources by Josh McDowell, who's an expert in this area. And that's kind of like your cup of tea and that's how you know, you're kind of a gearhead and like to know the, the whys behind everything. Just, uh, I do have listed at the bottom of your notes, hopefully it got into your notes, I think I put it in your notes, uh, a website you can go to called josh.org. You can go there, there's a host of different resources. Two books I'd highly recommend is Evidence Demands a Verdict, and then a, another book called More Than a Carpenter. More Than a Carpenter is what I 
personally use to give people, uh, give to people who question, you know, is Jesus really the Son of God? Can I really trust the Bible? It's really written in a very seeker-friendly way, and it's very powerful. So, uh, so how can I, how can I know that the Bible is the Word of God? There's just not a bunch of stories, a bunch of fables that that's just been kind of put together. And that's a very, you know, it's a very legitimate question. It's a question that we want to answer before we really begin to study the Bible because we want to know that we can trust the Bible. And I want to give you six reasons uh, this morning. Here's the first one is it's historically accurate. In other words, the Bible isn't just doctrinally correct and it, it doesn't just nail it in, in how we should live our life morally and ethically. But why is, why is that so important? Because, because it, why is it so important that it's historically accurate? Because the Bible tells us that God cannot lie. And there are some things that God absolutely can't do. And this is one of them things. God cannot lie because God is true. And God cannot deny himself. And Hebrews actually says that, Hebrews 6, 18, it says, these two things cannot change. God cannot lie when he makes a promise, and he cannot lie when he makes an oath. And the only reason the universe, uh, um, um, uh, is, you know, really exists, if you really think about it, is just because of all the laws that God has put in place. Look at gravity. Think about if gravity wasn't working or if it's just kind of, you know, working one day and takes a day off. You know, the, everything would be in chaos. But it's true. Gravity and, and the law of physics are true, and it works day in and day out every moment, and God's the one that thought this up and created this. The law of mathematics are true. The law of mathematics is what keeps our universe working together in beautiful harmony. Psalm 33, 4 says this, God's word is true, and everything he does is right. That's not only true when it comes to salvation, but it's true when it comes to history. So how do we know that the Bible is historically accurate? Well, if you talk to a historian, the first thing a historian w would ask is, do you have eyewitness accounts? Or is it second? Or is it handed down through generation or by generation? Or is it a legend that keeps being repeated? The, the Bible is primarily eyewitness accounts. And that's why it's good history. Moses didn't just pass on a legend. He was there at the parting of the Red Sea. Josh was there when the walls of Jericho fell. The disciples of Jesus was in the upper room when Jesus appeared after his resurrection. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was there during the times of the writings of the gospel. So you have eyewitness accounts of what happened. The other um, test of history, how we know that the Bible is accurate is the extreme care that they took in, in really copying the Bible. In the Old, the Old Testament, uh, scribes, and they're, they were called copyists, uh, these guys would, would uh, you know, do this copy, and they were like human Xerox machines, okay? And it had to be exact, and they had a, a couple different rules to follow. I'm just going to uh, just share with you one, uh, and we can look at this one rule and really draw comfort from how exact they were, but they knew in every single book that they translated um, how many different letters of the alphabet were supposed to be in that book. For instance, if they're using the English language, at the end of the book, they would, they would know that, okay, if they're, if they're looking at the letter A, that there's supposed to be maybe 1,653 A's. So what they would do is they would count how many A's was in that book, and if there was 1,654, they just chucked it. They didn't even try to go back and fix it. They just threw it, threw it away and started over again. They knew the exact middle letter of the Old Testament. So after they copied it, they'd find that middle letter. They'd count forward, count backwards. If it was off by one letter, they chucked it and started all over again. That's how exact they were. Another proof is archaeology. You look at archaeology and it proves the places uh, that the Bible talked about and the people that the Bible talked about actually were all true. And it's not fiction. You can go to these places today and see them. We've dug them up, we've discovered them, and you can actually go and view them. They found the theater in, in Athens where, Rome, where, where Paul kind of uh, got people all fired up and started a riot. I was in Israel a couple years ago, a year and a half ago. I saw the pool where the blind man was healed. Portions of Herod's temple you can, can view. All these, all these places, all these people that were talked about in the Bible 
have now been proven. And a book of Acts, when you look at that, is, is uh, about historical accuracy. I don't know if you know, but Luke was not only a doctor, but he was a historian. So in, so in his writings, he talks about 54 um, cities, 39 countries, and nine different islands. And when historians have looked at it, he's dead on a- accurate in everything that he reported. And archaeology has shown that the Bible is actually more, uh, uh, really more accurate than our ideas because there's been times in history where we said, well, you know what, that didn't exist. Only for years later, there's a discovery that proves the Bible existed. I'll give you an example. Years ago, historians didn't actually believe that Solomon existed. Or if he existed, he didn't use horses, he used camels. So what happened is they actually came across and discovered one of Solomon's chariot cities with thousands of stables for horses. Isn't that cool? I mean, the Bible was proven through archaeology there. It's scientifically proven. Now, the Bible doesn't use scientific language, but the Bible never gives bad science. Not once in over 1,600 years has, since the book has, has there ever been uh, bad science. In fact, it's always ahead of science because one thing is truth is truth. Truth never changes. But one thing about science, it is constantly changing. Why? Because we don't know everything. We're not God. I guarantee you the science book that you used in third grade, they're not using today. Why? Because they made so many more new discoveries. A lot of things uh, that we used to believe, we no longer believe. You look at the medical science. How many times, man, did you read about something now that as a child you were told was healthy? I want you to watch this video clip and I'll make a comment on it. You know, if you were to follow a busy doctor as he makes his daily round of calls, you'd find yourself having a mighty busy time keeping up with him. Time out for many men of medicine usually means just long enough to enjoy a cigarette. And because they know what a pleasure it is to smoke a mild, good-tasting cigarette, they're particular about the brand they choose. In a repeated national survey, doctors in all branches of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country were asked, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Once again, the brand named most was Camel. Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Why not change to camels for the next 30 days and see what a difference it makes in your smoking enjoyment? See how camels agree with your throat. See how mild and good tasting a cigarette can be. That's mind boggling. My cancer doctor is the one that told me about this, and when he started telling me about this, he's like leaning in. He's very passionate. I can't believe the medical community used to promote smoking, and he just would like go on this like really bend, you just saying, hey, they actually believed that it was actually healthy, that uh, they didn't know that there was any, it was harmful to your body. So they're thinking if you learn to relax by smoking, you know, there's health benefits to, to getting rid of the stress. And so he gets all fired up. He's like, hey, doc, we could go out and try to beat them up and find them, but they're all dead from cancer, you know? So anyway, but anyway... Anyway, science is constantly changing. If, you've been, if you read the Bible a thousand years ago, 500 years ago, or whatever, the Bible would not match what the current uh, uh, mindset of the culture was thinking when it comes to science. And, and God understands stuff that we didn't. And so you, you won't find what we didn't know uh, in the Bible. I mean, like in 1861, there was a, a, a book out. It was like, uh, I, I want to say it was like 51 scientific reasons why the Bible is off or whatever. It was a very popular book, okay? And his author was very aggressive saying, these are 51 scientific facts that prove that the Bible is inaccurate, that you don't trust the Bible. Well, fast forward it to our culture, there, there's not a science, 
scientists alive that would agree with any of those 51 statements that that guy made. Why? Because we've learned much more than, than what that guy had knowledge of. Truth does not change. And one of the proofs that we know that the, the, that the book is not simply man-made, it doesn't reflect the, the lies that, that people believed at that time when the Bible was being written. Now, I'm just kind of using an example. For thousands of years, people actually believed that the earth was flat. It wasn't until Columbus and some of those guys came along that, that we discovered it was ra- round. So you would expect the Bible, I mean, everybody's mindset when the Bible is being written that the earth was flat. And there's not one thought, there's not one scripture in the Bible that, that even suggests that the earth is flat. So thousands of years ago, God said this in Isaiah 40, verse 22, God sits on his throne above the circle of the earth. Thousands of years ago, while everybody was saying the earth is flat, it's recorded in the Bible, it's round. It's a circle. And Again, when everybody else believed it was flat, the Bible was telling us it was round. For thousands of years, people believed that the earth had to be held up by something. In the Greek culture, they believed that the world was actually being held up by a giant by the name of of Atlas. I'm sure you've all seen statues or pictures of of the dude that's all stressed out with the, with the, uh, the earth holding, you know, him holding up the earth. And part of the Bible was actually re- written in Greek, so you would think somebody might have, have slipped that thought in. At the same time, you had Hindus believe that the earth actually sat on the back of giant elephants. And so when the elephants moved, that's what caused earthquakes. Now, I'm not making this stuff up. They believe that the giant elephants stood on the back of giant sea turtles. Okay, and the giant sea turtles stood on the back of giant sea serpents who swam through a cosmic sea. Folks, you need a lot more faith to believe in that than to believe in Jesus. But that was the prevailing attitude for thousands of years, but it's not in the Bible. Why? Because the Bible leaves out lies. The prevailing science of the day was not recorded in the Bible because it wasn't true. In Job 26, 7, it says, God stretched the northern sky out over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. Well, who told Job that? Because everybody in the culture believed that something was holding the the world up. Obviously, the Spirit of God told Job that. And when everybody else is saying the world is flat, Atlas is, you know, carrying the the world, or these giant elephants are carrying the world, I mean, we have scripture saying just the opposite. And I'm reinforcing this because you'll hear the argument uh, how the Bible, you know, contradicts uh, science for today. That's really not true. For many years, people believed that, uh, that you're sick because you had too much blood in you. So for thousands of years, the medical field did something called bloodletting. So doctors would actually, I'm not trying to be gross, but would cut a person and drain some of the blood out. And so what they did is they actually believed that all sickness came from four bodily fluids, one being blood. And so, uh, again, for thousands of years, people believe, hey, man, just let out some blood and you'll get healthy. Many people don't know this, but George Washington actually died at the hands of his doctor by bleeding him to death. He actually had a heart problem. They didn't know how to deal with it, so they bled him once. He didn't get better. They bled him twice. He didn't get better. The third time, he gave up the ghost. And today, we give people healthy blood because we know it improves their health. And they could have known that if they had read the Bible, because here's what Leviticus 17.11 said thousands of years ago. It said this, life of the body is in the blood. Well, how did Moses do that? Again, God, through the Spirit of God, told him. During the, uh, the Middle Ages, You had the the black plague that swept Europe. Europe, one in four Europeans died. 
Why? Because they didn't understand germs. They didn't understand the spreading of germs and how, how um, uh, diseases are contagious. So you had these sick people, you know, um, eating dinner and eating at the table, sleeping with people that were healthy and became this huge epidemic. But again, if they had read the Bible thousands of years ago, Leviticus told us what to do with people that were uh, affected with the disease. He said this in Leviticus 13.4, the priest is to isolate the affected person for seven days. So if you had a disease, they would put you outside the camp for seven days. If you're better at, at the end of seven days, they would bring you back in. Or if you're still sick, they left you out there for another seven days and the disease didn't spread. And so we could go on and on in this area. I just want to wrap this point up with the scripture, Proverbs 30, verse 5. It says, every word of God is true. And then here's the third one, is it's prophetically accurate. And what does that mean? It means that the predictions in the Bible always come true. And the Bible is filled with literally a thousands of predictions that this is going to happen. It's going to happen in such a way. And over the centuries, these prophecies have come to pass. There are still some that need to be fulfilled, but there are over 300 prophecies that talk about Jesus being the Messiah. 300 prophecies that said, this is when he's going to be born. This is how he's going to be born. This is where he's going to be born. This is where, uh, how he's going to die. And what are the odds of me being able to make a prediction about any of you for just maybe 20 prophecies to come true? You know, it, it's just off the chart. You, you can't even wrap your mind around it. Here's an amazing prophecy. King David wrote part of the psalm. He was one of the psalmists, and he actually wrote a detailed description of Jesus dying on the cross, on, on the, cru the crucifixion. Now, here's the catch. They didn't know anything about crucifixion during David's time. Nobody was dying that way. They didn't invent that until the Roman time. How did, how did David know the details of the way Jesus was going to die on the cross? Again, it was God coming to him and talking with him and, and giving, downloading that information to him. Um, Peter Stoner was chairman of the Department of Mathematics and Astronomy at a California, California um, college, and he brought together these 600 researchers, and they were probability experts. And, and what they would do is they would, you know, study something to see, you know, what's the chances of this happening? Like if I had a box of tennis balls up here, and there's 10 yellow tennis balls, I took one, I spray painted it red, I put it, mixed it up, I blindfolded one of you guys, and hey, you have one pick to try to find that red tennis ball. You only have one pick. Well, what's the chances of that happening? Well, one in 10. But he brought these guys together uh, so that he could look at what's the probability of these prophecies being fulfilled that were foretold about Jesus. What he found out is that just eight of them being fulfilled would be 10 to the 17th power is the number. Now, I'm not a mathematic guy, but I'm trusting Josh McDowell just talking, that's a huge number. He goes and puts it in a practical way for guys that are not so smart like myself can get it. So you translate that into to silver dollars. So you translate that 10 to the 17th power into silver dollars. You have enough silver dollars to cover the entire state of Texas, two feet deep in silver dollars. You take one of those silver dollars and you paint it red and you just toss it somewhere in the state of Texas. And you grab a guy, you blindfold him, you put him in a helicopter and ask him where he wants to get dropped off. Remember, uh, Texas takes 14 hours to cross the state, okay? So anyway, you take this guy, you put him in a helicopter, you got one chance to pay, make one choice to try to find that red coin. The chance of that person grabbing that coin is the same chance that eight of those uh, 300 prophecies would come true. In other words, in human terms, it's absolutely impossible. But here's the deal. Prophecy doesn't have its origins in humans. Prophecy was written and spoken by God himself. And the Bible tells us this in 2 Peter 1.21. For no prophetic message ever came just from human will. But people were under the control of the Holy Spirit as they spoke the message that came from God. 
Jesus said this in Matthew 26, 56. But this is all, this all happened to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in Scripture. Jesus is saying, hey, all this is coming true because God said it's going to come true. That's why it's so important that we have Jesus at the center of our life. I'm just going to be honest with you. From my perspective, Jesus could come back at any moment. In my opinion, it's all the prophecies has been uh, fulfilled leading up to Jesus coming back. And so Jesus could come back tonight. He can come back next week, whatever. And that's why it's just very important. We keep short accounts with each other. We keep short accounts with God. And Jesus is uh, at the center of our life. This is not a day in which we should be flirting with the world or playing games with God. Amen? Here's the fourth thing. The unified theme is from cover to cover. From Genesis to Revelation, there's the same theme of redemption from Genesis to the end, and Jesus is the star. And you may say, well, what's the big deal? Man, I read all kinds of books that you have a, a common theme through it. I want to stop this and just remember that it was written over 1,500 years. So this one book was written over 1,500 years by 40 different authors in three different continents in three different languages, and they all came up with a common theme. How do you get that same story like that? And it wasn't even collected in one book until like a thousand years after everybody, was, after everybody died uh, in the Old Testament. It's one thing if one person wrote a book with a common theme. The Quran was written by one book, by one person, and that's Muhammad. The writings of Buddha are written by Buddha. So you would expect those to be uniform. Again, I want to remind you, the Bible was written over a 1,500-year period by 40 different authors on three continents and three different languages. It was written by people from all kinds of backgrounds, prophets. You had um, sailors. You had soldiers. You had kings. You had prisoners. You had common people, all kinds of people wrote the Bible. It was written in all kinds of locations. You had part of the Bible written in caves, on ships, in prisons, in, king, in, in, in palaces, in, in people's homes. It's where the uh, Bible is written. When you look at it, you couldn't bring together a more diverse group of people than the people that wrote the Bible. And from the cover to cover, what they transcribed had a common theme over 1,500 years of redemption. Many places, many people, over many centuries, and yet one thing. A lot of times people think, well, when New Testament is all about Jesus, Old Testament is about Israel. The New Testament wasn't even written when Jesus walked the planet. When he talks about the Word of God, he was actually referring to the Old Testament. And one of the things I stumbled upon as I was researching this out that I really, I, I, I think I put it in your notes. If not, you might want to jot this down. Is another book I want to highly recommend. It's by a, a lady by the name of Henrietta Mears. And uh, she wrote a book on how to understand the Bible. And she actually uh, worked under Billy Graham. Uh, she was one of her intercessors. And God just put on her heart this idea of writing a book to help people understand the uh, the Bible and it really she's done a wonderful job it's like this cliff note version of every book of the Bible so you can turn to the section of her book uh, where she's referring to Leviticus and she'll she'll highlight where you can find Jesus the theme of Jesus through the book of Leviticus or Exodus. And, and her whole thing is the Bible is one book with Jesus weaving through the whole thing. And, and she actually lays it out in a beautiful fashion. So I'm going to be on a new mission trying to get people to read this book because it's an outstanding book. Again, I just wish I would have discovered this years ago. Jesus said this in Luke 24, 27. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. The stories about Jesus from beginning to end. The word pictures, the metaphors, the stories, everything in scripture from beginning to end is about God's plan of redemption for mankind. All about him having an eternal family that's going to spend uh, eternity with him. It all begins with Jesus. He's the star of the story. You see him in every book, and we're going to be talking about that more next week. John 539, 
Jesus said, you search the scripture because you believe they give you eternal life. But the scripture point to me. Now here's the other thing, and I'm just going to kind of go down just a short bunny trail. Jesus trusted the Bible. You'll, you'll hear some people say, well, I trust Jesus. But you know what? I don't know, know that I trust these other authors uh, in the Bible. Here's the deal. Jesus trusted those other authors of the Bible. Jesus trusted the Bible. So here's the deal. If we're trusting Jesus, we need to trust in what Jesus trusted in. And Jesus trusted in the Bible. And you have some people say, well, Stan, you know, the times have changed. And we've got to kind of change with the times. And, you know, the Bible is, is really kind of outdated, man. I mean, it needs to be, like, uh, updated. There needs to be a new version of it. I want to say this. We don't change the Bible to fit your lifestyle. We change to line up our lifestyle with the Word of God. Augustine said this, if you only believe in the parts of the Bible you like and you, do, you don't believe what you don't like, it's not the Bible you trust, but yourself. And really what you're creating is your own personal religion. The Bible is always reliable. I want to encourage you, embrace it and trust it. Again, like I, I said last week, don't run it through the filter. Hey, I don't understand it. I don't get it. So, so because of that, I'm not going to embrace it. I'm getting ready to leave here today and have lunch. I'm going to be honest with you. I do not understand how my digestive system works. But that is not going to stop me from having lunch today. And I'm just trying to give you word pictures. That's who I am. I'm trying to give you a word picture. Jesus trusted the Bible. And we may not have all the whys behind it and understand everything. We can trust it, and we need to trust it, and we need to embrace it. And here's the fifth thing is it has survived all attacks. The Bible is the most hated, despised book of all time. Millions of people have died because they wouldn't deny the Bible or they, were got, they got caught with the Bible. And, and still nobody has been able to stop the Word of God from moving forward in our culture. It's still illegal in some countries. Today, if you go to North Korea, you get caught with the Bible, you're going to either face imprisonment or death. And the Bible has been under attack for centuries by all kinds of forces coming against it. However, like I said earlier, the Bible is still the most read book. It's the most translated book. It's the all-time best-selling book, and it still is changing people's life. Jesus said this in Matthew 24, earth and sky will be destroyed, but the words I have said will never be destroyed. The only thing on this planet that's going to survive is the Word of God. Everything else is going to burn up with the exception of the Word of God because it's truth and it's eternal. I don't know if you ever heard of the guy, uh, a fr famous French philosopher, Voltaire. And uh, he was considered to be a brilliant man, considered to be a genius. Uh, in my opinion, he may have been real smart in some areas. He was really dumb in some other areas because he made this statement. And he said this, uh, and this was a famous statement. He said, 100 years from today, the Bible will be a forgotten book. <laughs> Folks, God has a sense of humor. <laughs> because after Voltaire died, for nearly 100 years, his house and his property was used by the French Bible Society to distribute Bibles throughout France. Now it's a museum. Pretty much God, people have forgotten who Voltaire is, but you know what? They have not forgotten a Bible. Again, scripture says, heaven and earth will pass away. My word will never pass away. And everyone in this room, we need to decide what's going to be the final authority in our life. Is it going to be the world or is it going to be the word? And it's not this weekend thing, this kumbaya thing where we feel good or this rah-rah session where, man, we're going to come together um, today and hopefully it'll be enough to get me through next week. No, we need to have the mindset, I'm going to live by this. I'm going to learn it. I'm going to study it. I'm going to get together with a group of people and really understand how I can apply this to my life. I'm going to live my life according to the Word of God. It's going to be the final authority in my life. Which means there's going to be times that you're going to be reading the Bible and there's going to be something that, that ruffles your feathers. 
You follow what I'm saying? You're saying, man, I don't agree with that, man. I don't understand the why behind that. You need to have the mindset that, you know what? I may not understand the why behind it, but if God says it's true, I need to do it. And I need to line up, say, God, help me to make this change, to line up with, with your word and know that, that you can trust it. The world is trending, obviously, away from the truth of God. You know what? I have no power over that. Let it trend the way it's going to be. Our government um, probably will probably embrace further laws that, that's going against our faith. I cannot control that. So be it. Again, I can't control that. But when it comes to how I live my life, I'm going to live my life according to the authority of God's word. They can come. They can arrest me. I'm not going to deny God. I'm not going to deny his word. And I want to encourage you, me, encourage you to join me with that mindset because truth is truth. It doesn't matter what, what Hollywood says. It doesn't matter what the government says. It doesn't matter what culture says. It's what the word of God says. Amen? Here's the last point. It's life-changing. It and I want to tell you, you can, you can test yourself in this area. You, you can test it. I want to challenge you. If you're not doing this right now, and if you only have 15 minutes that you can give God, I want to give you a challenge. Give God 15 minutes of your time. Start off with five minutes of worship. Download some of these worship songs that we sing on Sunday morning. Uh, worship for five minutes. Pray for five minutes. Begin to read the Word of God for five minutes. Step into that. And I guarantee you, your life will begin to change. Will it be perfect? No, but I guarantee you, your life will be better than it was last year. Come to as many services as you can. And what you'll, have, what you'll begin to see is your life will begin to change from the inside out. And, uh, and the Bible <clears throat> has power to change your life. Jesus said that in John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus said, if you... If you hold to my teaching, that's an interesting thing. He said, if you hold to my teaching, and I want to challenge you to step into it. If you haven't made that commitment to spend time with God on a daily basis, leave here with that commitment. <clears throat> and it says, go down and says, you, uh, if you hold on to his teaching, it says, you are really my disciple. Disciples goes beyond just simply attending a weekend service. I grew up going to church every single week. Man, but I was lost as lost can be. Why? Because I didn't take hold of it. I did not have a relationship with God. I just simply went to church to please my parents. I had no relationship with God. I did not take hold of it. It goes on to say in verse 32, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It will heal your marriage. It will heal relationships in your life. It will help you understand how to manage money. It will change your life. It will set you free. But as Jesus said, you've got to take hold of it. Amen? Let's just bow our heads and pray right now. And I just want to encourage you. Um, with the worship team coming forward, I just encourage you just to, to remain seated here just for a moment. And I want to encourage you just to pray this prayer between you and God. God, from this day forward, God, I recognize your word to be my final authority in my life. Not what Hollywood says, not what culture says, not what I, my friends say, not what I feel like I should do, but God, I want to look at what, is you, what are you telling me? What are you telling me in your word? And God, give me the strength when it's not easy to be obedient to your word. Thank you, God, for loving me enough to speak to me through your word. Thank you that you're not silent. God, help me to love your word with all my life, with all my heart. God, help me to, to learn, to embrace it, and to live it out in my life. And maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If that's you today, I just want to encourage you just to simply pray this prayer. God, I understand today that you are the truth. And I realize that I need to humble myself and acknowledge that I need a Savior. And today, I humble myself. God, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I need your grace. I need Jesus in my life. And I ask you right now, forgive me for all my sins. 
God, cleanse me from everything I've done wrong. And Jesus, I invite you into my life. God, that you would just come in, that you would give me a new heart. God, give me a fresh start in life. And God, I choose to follow you. And Father, right now, I pray over every single person here. I pray over every family represented here today. God, every single one of us has a need today. God, and I pray, Father, that people would receive strength where they need strength, God. They would need hope where they need hope, God. That they would receive peace where there's anxiety. That they'd receive forgiveness where there needs to be forgiveness, God. And I just speak forth a blessing over every single person here today. We pray these things in the all-powerful name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.